The very first entitlement program in American history was to care for the wounded soldiers and widows of the Revolutionary War. If you look at the current federal budget and programs, it's clear entitlements have grown dramatically over the centuries. We wondered how it all got out of hand. So we talked with author John Kogan about the high cost of good intentions. Do you think people would be surprised to know, A, how big the problem has gotten, and B, that there doesn't seem to be a great solution on the horizon? It's a gradual process that takes place over many, many years. Good intentions. Good intentions. So we start with a group that are, everyone agrees is very, very worthy. And then the people that are just outside the eligibility circle, well, they're nearly as worthy. How badly has it ballooned? In 2016, the last year for which we have data, 54% of all U.S. households were receiving benefits from at least one federal entitlement program. More than half of American households were getting some sort of entitlement. Right. But if you take out those that are receiving Social Security and Medicare, because everyone over age 65 receives those, right? So take it out. Among households that are headed by a person under age 65, 41% of them are receiving an entitlement benefit. So back in the 1970s, it was closer to around 20, 25%. So talk about the consequences then. Why is this a problem? First, as well-meaning as these programs are, their cost is very, very high. Part of it is what I call a human cost. These entitlement programs, to some extent, undermine individuals' incentives to be self-sufficient and for self-improvement. At the same time, we have to worry about the high fiscal costs. Our budget deficit for the last year was $666 billion. The vast majority of that deficit is not due to defense spending. It's not due to the NIH spending, not due to NASA. It's due to the large body of entitlements. We spend about $2.5 trillion on entitlements, and it accounts for the large deficit we have today. So then is Congress to blame if we had to point a finger? Well, I would point a finger at Congress because I think they understand the problem and have not chosen to address it. Having said that, I do think the problem is with us in a way, Americans. What's your worst case scenario that you think might actually occur one day? We know that either taxes have to be increased enormously if we don't take any action in the next 10 years. Economics tells us if we try to raise taxes to finance this, this entitlement problem, we're going to kill off the economy. History tells us that if we issue too much public debt, we are going to have a financial crisis of very serious proportions. So right now, if there's a cliff, are we miles away from it, driving in that direction? Are we in the vicinity, or are we standing on the edge looking over? We're not at the point where we're standing looking over the abyss, but I do think we are driving very rapidly and more rapidly every year. Of the entitlements right now that pose the biggest concern, what's the largest culprit? In terms of dollars, Social Security and Medicare. Those are the two. I think today, both of them will total about 40% of government spending. And they're growing at a very, very fast rate. All right, so then that's a relatively fatalistic viewpoint. Give me a reason to be optimistic that we can turn this thing around. America has always been able to solve major problems. I have the ultimate confidence that Americans will step up, will figure out a way to get these entitlements under control, while at the same time maintaining those honorable goals that most of these programs began with. One more example from Kogan. 60 years ago, federal health care assistance went to about 2% of the population. Today, about 20% of Americans receive federal money for their health care.